Darrens of the Fox Cities. My name is Len Van Brady. I'm the executive director. Can I just have a show of hands of anybody that's been here before? Okay, good. Well, I'm glad you're back. Um, you'll thoroughly enjoy the evening. I've heard Dan speak several times. He's also on our site committee, and he's a very good friend of the garden. So, um, any questions you have about trees, Dan can answer. So, I just want to. <laughs> That's pressure. <laughs> um, I have also an evaluation form at the end. If you could please fill that out. And uh, there are some pens up here. And last but not least, I have um, some membership forms here. We have a deal right now that because you have taken a class, uh, individual membership is $50. And because you have taken the class, we dropped the membership right now to $40. So it saves a little bit if you're thinking joining the gardens. And last, and one more thing, we also have an email um, subscription. You can either sign up here or you can sign up on our website, whether you're a member or not, and you can get our email updates. And the updates come out once a week throughout the summer and throughout the winter a little less often. And it just talks about updates, um, volunteer opportunities, what's happening at the gardens, classes such as this, and et cetera, et cetera. So anyway, enjoy your evening and have a good time. Yeah. That's me. Welcome to the Gardens of the Fox Cities. What I think is perhaps the best kept secret as far as green space and gardening in the Fox Valley. It's the best kept secret unintentionally. It's just we don't have enough people who know about this place. And it is a phenomenal resource. And I had the opportunity to speak here quite often, all right? So that's a very, that's a very good thing. I feel very close to this, this operation because of that. The other things that I do, all right? My name is Dan Trost. I'm the owner of Ranger Services, which is a landscape company, uh, urban forestry management and consulting operation based here in the Fox Valley. And one of the things that's really exciting that I get to do is I get to travel around the country hauling these things around and talk to people about trees. Now, if you want to stab me, call it firewood. Okay, I'm a tree geek, and I collect these things. I have, this is maybe a 20th of my collection, all right? This is the kind of things I do. If we're going to talk about trees to people, we got to touch them. we got to see them. we got to be the tree. we got to feel the tree. I have the opportunity also, I'm an adjunct instructor at Mid-State Technical College in the Urban Forestry Program. Fox Valley Technical College in the Landscape Horticulture and Northeast Wisconsin Technical College in Green Bay in their Landscape Horticulture. So I get all these people I get to infect about trees. And I have one big goal tonight. And that is when you leave, to change the way you look at trees for the rest of your life. If that sounds scary, you better leave now and one locks the door so I have you trapped here anyway. So for the next seven hours, we're just kidding. <laughs> okay. I do. So many presentations, sometimes I'm up here entertaining myself. So if you're just like, what is he talking about? Where is he going? I might just be entertaining myself. I will tie it all back together again. Okay? So, what's the topic tonight? Trees. That's right. And we're going to talk about the difference between having your trees survive and having them thrive. Now, if you're going to plant a tree, or someone's going to plant a tree, you're going to buy a tree. How long do you expect that tree to live? 50 years. How long? 50 years. 50 years? Okay. If I said, here's a great tree, typically people tell me they go somewhere from 100 years to forever. All right, forever is a really long time. Okay. But what they're saying is this tree should outlast me. Now, we do have trees, like if you were going to plant a palm tree, uh, you know, you're going to find a life for that down south, right? So. <laughs> Sour native Wisconsin tree. If I was going to plant a tree and I said, You're going to love this tree, it's going to live 7 to 25 years for you. You want two? All right. How's that sound? This doesn't sound real good, doesn't it? Arbor Day, the last Friday in April, celebrated across the United States on different days in April typically, millions of trees are going to ground. And millions of trees are going to ground to die prematurely for how they go to ground. When we look at all the benefits that trees give us, and one of the ones that people think of right away is the aesthetics that they give, the benefits that trees give us, aesthetics is actually one of the lower ones. 
aside from giving us oxygen, things like that, there is research that shows that people who are recovering in hospitals recover faster when they have a window of green space and trees. Schools that have green space and trees in the schoolyards have higher achieving students. Cities and neighborhoods that have trees in them, tree, tree streets, have less crime. Stores and shopping areas that have trees and green space around, people spend more time at it than areas that they do not. There's a member of benefits. Store water runoff costs are hugely reduced when there's trees. More effective than any stormwater treatment center. We have all these benefits that we have, and we live, we live in an urban forest. Now, what's the definition of urban? Most time we think urban, we think Chicago, New York, things like that. If you're a tree, it's concrete. Because it's not part of their natural makeup. It's not part of their genetics. Make sense? Okay, we're going to talk genetics here. You got to be creative, you got to work with me. All right? I'm a weeping willow. You got it? Okay. My branch gets pruned off. How does it grow back? The same way, right? Mm -hmm. They have to. It's genetically programmed. It's the genetics of the tree. We can't make a weeping willow do something different. That's the way it's going to grow. That's the genetics. Okay, what type of site do willows like? Wet. I heard, yeah, wet. It's the biggest pump we have in Wisconsin. Take a willow, put it in a real dry site. It'll scream at you. You can hear it. Put your ear against the trunk. Tell your neighbors you're listening. They'll like it. Okay. They'll get mad and they'll scream. That's the genetics of the tree. Has anybody ever been in a sugar maple swamp? No. Sugar maple, our state tree, is an upland species. It won't tolerate having its feet wet. I had a, uh, a local uh, landscape company call me up and they said, would you go out and take a look at these trees we planted on this commercial site? We planted sugar maple. Everyone's dying. And they put each one of the corners at the end of the downspots. Can't happen. Genetically programmed, it's an upland species. Now, what are our oldest living tree species that we have in Wisconsin? Which, which ones live the longest? Oaks. Oaks. Yeah, definitely oaks. Walnuts, hickory, sugar maple. Okay? When we see them in their native environment, where, what type of site do we see them living in? They're upland. Our lowland trees, honey locust, silver maple, Elm, willow, or do not live as long. Okay? They're a bottom of the tree. We're going to visit this again if you're looking at the genetics because, as an industry, the green industry often doesn't look at the genetics of the tree and where it's supposed to go. When I was in forestry school back when they were inventing trees, it was a long time ago, they said plant the right tree in the right location. And all that meant was don't put a tree under the power lines. We didn't look farther than what that tree is going on. So what we're going to do here is we're going to grow a tree right now. Do you remember as a little kid when someone taught you to count the rings to see how old that tree was? Remember that? We're pretty young, all right? And we knew that every year we have to add another ring, right? And that ring gets added from the very base of the tree to the very tip top of the tree. We add that ring of growth. Now, if you're looking at a 100-year-old tree, what part's 100 years old? The base. The base, that's right. Not the very tip top. That's just one year old, the newest spot. So, so, but we add that ring, OK? Keep adding that ring. Now, the garden's asking me to go all out with special effects. <laughs> We're going to come back with the ring. I need you to work with me here. This is a tree, OK? And there's a wound on the tree. And every year, we add a ring of growth. And we add another ring of growth. And what happens to the wound? It's still there. But it gets closed. It gets sealed. Here's the fascinating, incredible point. Trees do not have the ability to heal. Ever. Ever. Trees cannot heal. Every one of us somewhere 
we have some scratch or ding or scar or something on us, and we regenerate new tissue and we heal. It's amazing too, if you get like a paper cut or something, you find out how many times a day you bump that spot. All right, I never knew I bumped that spot on my thumb that many times a day, but that little cut, all right? And then we regenerate new tissue and we heal. A tree cannot ever heal. If it could heal, we would have had this. And if we didn't have this, think of how tough life would be if you were a wood duck, or a raccoon, or a squirrel. You are relying on these cavities in these trees. When a tree has an injury, it sets up compartments around the injury. And the sealing process we call is compartmentalization. It sets up these compartments. All right? Now, we'll go back to this piece. Can you see back there this light layer right around here? This thing right? That's the only living part on this. This is just wood. This is the part that's living. This is the part that transports the water. It transports uh, the, the, the leaves that make the food, transports it down. This is, what we call it the cambium, the vascular cambium. That's the living part of the tree. Every tree in the planet is only living in the last couple of years growth. So we can have a tree that's hollow, and it's still living and looking good. You may not even know it's hollow because the outside brain is functioning. All right? On this young tree, I'm going to pass this around, but from my finger out, that's the part that's living. On a young tree, it's very rigorous. Think of, uh, think of kids. You know, you can buy them something on Tuesday, they'll grow it on Friday. You know, how fast, how fast if young children will grow. All right, the younger tree's doing that too. It's growing very rapidly. So there's much more living material in a young tree. So, what happens when you have a tree with a lawnmower? What part of the tree gets injured? The living part. The living part. Just this much. How much would it take to hit that with a lawnmower and do damage? Wouldn't take much, would it? Wouldn't take much at all. And it can't heal. All it can try to do is close over that wound. I saw a tree one time in Waukesha County. It was a six inch mount ash. It was cut down over many years by a weed wind. They're going around, going around. We've got a pencil on its point. You know, keeping real manicured grass, going around, going around, behind the thing, and then going over. All right? Very gradual. How bad is this for a tree? Yeah, kiss of death, isn't it? What part of the tree is this damaging? The living part that has to expand, as you told me, has to get a new ring every year. Right? Has to get a new ring of growth every year. This nylon rope prevents that from happening. This is putting a belt on a five-year-old and saying you can never take it off. Wouldn't be real comfortable. Okay, we're going to remember the fact that they seal, they can't heal. So everything you've ever done to a tree is there for its life. Okay, it's there for its life. Now, genetics of the tree. I need help from you three. Could you stand up, please? This will be relatively painful, painless, okay? All right, now, I need you to be trees. Oh, you're very good at it. You have a degree in this, don't you? Okay. Here's my forest, right? In the forest, trees are all put a little wind. Shh, okay, beautiful. In the forest, trees grow up like this on their own. Do we plant them like this in our yards? We're in our parks? We're on our streets? No, we go, that's too close. We can't plant those together like that. So, all three of these trees are growing in the woods. And what are they, and what are they competing for? Oxygen, water, and nutrients. And the tree that can't get as much, what happens to it? Oh, behind in the right. There you go. You're done. <laughs> These two killed you. <laughs> okay. Twenty percent of the forest dies every twenty years. It has to. And then over time, another one happens. Another one goes down. And we end up with our dominant tree in the forest. Do you have a question? No, I'm sorry. <laughs> Thank you. If you put your hands down, sit down. Okay, our dominant tree in the forest here, 
And this is how, this is where this plays in. You ever put the news on in the fall of the year? In October, they show that map in Wisconsin that shows the color change. 50% color change here, 30% color change here. How's this for a marketing plan? Come see the murderous tree in the forest that's out there in full color after it killed up its own kind, and when they fell to the ground, she ate them. They kill up their own kind, they eat them. Genetically, they have to. For this tree to be the dominant tree in the forest, it has to dominate the site it's on and outcompete over here. It doesn't have a choice. It has to dominate its site. Dominate below ground, dominate above ground. Now, I throw a challenge at you. Go to a lumber store and try to find a straight two by four. <laughs> Some of them are made for building around corners, right? <laughs> Okay, particularly some of the discount lumber stores a lot of times, two by fours come from the interior of young trees that are massively a lot more growth, a lot more living tissue. Because of that, the cells are bigger, which means they warp so much easier. That's not going to help you find a straight two by four. But you're going to know why you can't find a straight two by four, because it's from the interior of a young tree, which is growing so fast to get to the top of the forest so it can live. Now the significance of that, plant a tree in your yard. You go to a nursery, garden center, you get a tree, you bring it home, you plant it, you have it come and plant it, you get a new tree in your yard. What's that tree have to do? It has to dominate the site it's on. It doesn't have a choice. In the forest, it would go, I gotta go like that. Green ash in the woods grows like this. Green ash in the yards grows like this. Because it's going, I don't have the competition, so I'm gonna spread out and dominate more, more space. It has to dominate. Now, the heart, the pulse, and the brain of the tree is below ground. When you go to the garden centers and hardware stores and you buy different things for your trees, most of us retreat from the above ground. The part of the tree we love the most is the top 12 feet because we can reach it. The part that's keeping you alive is below ground. Root research is really hard to do because you gotta get dirty, you gotta dig in the dirt, you gotta chunk out. And people don't wanna do research on that. They wanna do the research on the stuff they can see. So what we know about roots has been slower in our development in the science of tree care. So, how far out do the roots go? Depends on the tree. Now let's say a oak tree this big certainly is going to have a bigger root system than a little crab apple this big. But in general, the species all pretty much do the same on how far out they go. Now many years ago in forestry school, we used to talk about the roots go out to the drip line of the tree, edges and branches. And that way if you get branches got pruned off, the roots would turn and grow back in real quick because they couldn't go any farther. Right? Or some of those columnar trees, which are bred to grow in tight areas, they roots only go and they stop, right? They started finding out in the mid 1980s that roots grow up two to three times the height of the tree. Then a gentleman at the University of Kentucky in Louisville put some radioactive elements in the trees, went out in the nature of the Geyer and found roots five times the height of the tree. Well, spreading out. That's a pretty big spread, isn't it? All right, you transplant a tree, bring it over. How much of that root system do you get? Not much. Very, very little compared to. Sometimes they figure ninety percent of the roots get left back, and we don't get a lot. Of okay, now how deep do roots go? Do you ever remember hearing that thing? Whatever you see in the top is what grows down the bottom. Years back, and way back, we used to talk about that. That's a carrot. Okay, that's not a tree. So how deep do they go? Okay, let's go this way. Are roots living? Okay, what do you need to live? Food, food, water, food, water, and oxygen. Okay, do we have more food or better soil, water, and oxygen at the top of the soil or down deep? You betcha, top of the soil. That's where it is. So if you're a root, where do you want to grow? You don't want to go deep. Okay, anybody ever dug a hole in the Fox Valley? <laughs> what do you get? Clay that you can make pottery out of. Heavy duty stuff. 
our roots will go down as far as the oxygen allows it. We need 10 to 15 percent soil oxygen for roots to thrive and do their thing and reproduce. We get about 7 to 10 percent they can live and they can't really function so much. And you get below that, you get down to 6, 5 percent or less and they will die. They're a living, growing part of the tree, they need oxygen. Question the gentleman asked, what about the tap run? Great question. And let's grab this one. Look at the sample. I'm right? holding on to what was the tap run. Some species have a bigger tap run. If you ever plant a seedling that's an oak or a hickory or a walnut, you get a top like this, and you get a tap run that'll come down like that. A tap run is a juvenile stage of the tree. And it's nature's way of saying, you might have a tough time getting established, so we're going to let you push down farther to get yourself established so you can dominate the site you're on. Now, think like an acorn. What's your biggest fear? <laughs> exactly. So, nature said, we're going to let you get a tapper so you can push down and get established so some squirrels are going to come by and dig up and have a feast. The taproot goes down until the oxygen limits it, and then it turns like a hockey stick. It comes off. Our taproot species generally are our biggest species. They're more difficult to get established. Walnuts, hickories, oaks, and they all have fruit that is eaten. Have you ever heard of a root system or roots getting into a Sewer. Why? Roller rulers made a, an industry out of it. Okay, and, and some other places too. That's the, the most famous one. So, how far deep, how deep are uh, sewer lines? Frost yeah, below the frost line. Eight feet. So, how does the root get down there? Here it is. The root's growing along, and they're listening for the flush. <laughs> and when they hear the flush, they turn and go straight down until they hit the sewer line. Then they rear back and they keep slamming into it until they bust it open. And what do they find in the sewer line? Woo! Party time if you're a rut. <laughs> Nutrients galore. Water, oxygen, the roots have them all. Sound realistic? That's a broken sewer line. And oxygen's coming up, telling the root you can come down. Because the roots aren't going down there. If that sewer line is correct, they can't live the one down that way. They can't. <coughs> Roots attacking the foundation of a house. So, you're going to have better soil, water, and oxygen up against the house or out in the yard? Out in the yard. Because when you get, a lot of times you have an overhang in the house. If it comes in, it does damage the foundation, your foundation is already cracked. It's the oxygen diffusing, bringing the roots in allowing them to come in. They don't do the old Viking storm in the castle, ramming into the, ramming into the castle door because they can't grow and come back and grow and come back. Your top roots that keep your tree alive, depending if you're in a sandy or clay soil, it would be about the top six to 18 inches of the soil. If you're real sandy, you might go down a couple more feet. You get roots below that, and those are for support to hold the tree up, to help hold it up. That's, that's the part they do. Okay, so we just grew a tree. Now, if you're a root, this is this is the roots from one tree. Roots will graft to each other on the same species of tree because they're chemically and physically the same. Okay, now now we're going to do. You guys didn't know a test question was coming. Okay, here we go. What part of the tree is this? <clears throat> okay. Now I work with a lot of kids groups and they're a lot faster than you guys. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not putting pressure on you here. Okay. What part is this? This is the roots. Okay. Now, where do we find the roots? First eight inches. Right. In the ground. ground. Where do we find the trunk? In the air. Your masters. <laughs> that is all the secret is to planting so your tree can thrive 
and not just your body. The trunk goes in the air, the roots go in the ground. So what's the problem? Making sure the roots are in the ground and making sure the trunk is in the ground too. Okay, the job of the roots, absorption and transport to hold the tree up, right? Job of the trunk is to hold the tree up to get the leaves up into the sunlight so it can do that photosynthesis thing, okay, make food for the tree. That was seventh grade biology. All right, that's four years of my life right there. Okay, so the, uh, just entertaining myself. <laughs> the roots have to expand and dominate the site they're on. When this tree sprouted, now I'm going to take you back again. Go back when you were a little kid and you grew that lima bean in the styrofoam cup in grade school. You remember that? Did yours live? Oh, she gave me the look that did. This is a bad memory. <laughs> <laughs> wow, I just I look back. Okay. That little line would be sprouting. We got to watch the sprout going up and the sprout coming down for the roots. Same thing happened to this tree. This tree doesn't wait to get 40 feet tall and go, I don't have any roots, it might fall over. When it sprouts, it selects, depending on the species and its location, three to 12 main structural support roots that are there for the life of the tree. Three to 12. If you're a tree growing on the edge of the woods, you're going to have the 12 because you're open to more wind than if you're a tree growing in the middle. If you're a crab apple, you're going to have fewer than if you're a mighty oak. That makes sense, right? So those main structural support roots have to be there for the life of the tree. So uh, what do you think gets cut when sidewalks get redone? Or curb and gutters sometimes. We're in the main structural support roots, aren't we? Do you remember that storm, uh, June 11, 2001? Massive storm hit the Fox Valley. We had wind speeds that went from 12 miles an hour to 92 miles an hour in 37 seconds. It's the biggest storm ever worked. There are some streets um, in Appleton where the trees get laid straight down, just like little toothpicks, and they all came out of the ground where, where they had to do the cutting and the trenching and the root systems when they did street repair. Now, they did the street repair correctly. They did the work correctly, but it shows the value of this part of the tree. We call this the root plate. When we get into this part, we do this one. This is the zone of rapid taper. This is what, where it tapers off. You can see where it gets its name. This is the heart that pulls the brain of the tree. This is the most sensitive part of the tree. Have you ever seen people use root systems in landscape art to make a flower bed out of it? It's this part of the tree. Driftwood, when it's sold, is this part of the tree. It's the last part of the tree to decompose. Because if it could decompose, nature would be having its trees fall over a lot more. This is the last part. How about when they're building a highway or widening a highway? And you see where they have all those roots stopped up on the side? They used to bury them, they have a sinkhole 50 years later. Now they slowly burn them and smolder because it takes so long to decompose. Nature intended this, the zone of rapid taper, to be the strongest part of the tree. And these form these structural support roots at the time of germination. When you transplant a tree and put it in your yard, that's happening. Your support roots are there, and the tree has to redominate the site, the new site that you brought to. See how these roots grow up, kind of like the spokes of a bicycle, in all directions? Okay. That's a good root system. So, what happens here? Here's the trunk, here's the root. Chemically and physically different. They cannot grow together. Roots will grow to the roots. They'll do that. The trunk cannot grow to a root. Because, as you told me, the roots belong in the ground, in a moist environment, the trunk belongs in the air. So they're chemically and physically different. They can't grab to each other. They want to grow like this, like the spokes of the bison. Next 
here when you pass it. But I want you to take a look at how far around this root wraps around the trunk of the tree. Okay? As my eyes right now, can you see how, how where it starts and wraps around? Okay, how much of the trunk is, is comprised by that? 100% girl. Now, what's the difference between that and this? And we know this is bad, right? And you told me right in the beginning that this tree has to get bigger in diameter every year. Now this was put on by a person. That root growing around there was grown by the tree. So why would a tree grow a root that would kill itself? It is trying to survive. How's this? failed in the storm. <coughs> oh, it was a bad storm my tree stamp. It was like a vice grip of its own root system around it. And that's how it failed. Okay. Does this look like a tree that gets to live to be its full life expectancy? I pulled this one out of the black pot. This never even made it to the landscape. It's a big yeah, it was. It was really big. So great big ones, great big ones. And if you follow this, there's another one I'm going to pass around, you will see that the entire trunk is engulfed by its own root system. Yes? I can't recall ever having bought a tree to replant that had a nice root system almost in various so There's one main one, or else it's all kind of really straight. This gentleman has indicated he can't recall ever buying a tree that had a good root system that was spreading out. How can that be? Could be. Could be left in the pot too long. Let's go back even farther. Let's go back to what we talked about with the genetics. Where in the genetic makeup of a tree does it get pulled from where it's growing and get moved? elves that make cookies in the woods do in the spring, right? They're moving trees around the woods, right? It's, transplanting is not part of the genetic makeup of a tree. Pruning is because there's storm damage, which is a natural event. The tree knows how to lose the limbs and keep functioning. Insects and diseases are part of the natural environment. Transplanting a tree is not. So if we recognize how a tree grows and how it wants to grow by dominating its roots and spreading out, and we recreate that, we have the best success in setting that tree up to thrive. Because when we grow a tree in a nursery and then start to move it, we alter that root system. And the tree now has a choice. It adapts or it dies. Now, if you're going to look to be thousands of years old, and some species do, you better be pretty good at adapting. You have to be pretty good. But, if most of the trees we plant start dying between 7 and 25, 30 years because of how they're planted, something's not working as good as it could be. It's this. Trunk flare, root flare, our root plate indoor zone of rapid taper. The trees you see in our urban residential environment that have this, are going to live a long time. The trees that go on the ground with like a telephone pole are not. Now I'm getting the look. If somebody went to your yards right now, you're thinking how your trees look at it. I know the look. Okay. You'll be out there tomorrow digging around the snow looking at how yours go on the ground. If you go into the woods, this is how they grow. When I ask kids groups when I work to draw a tree, they draw a tree with the trunk and they flare up. I had one little girl one time, she was five years old, and she drew the trunk straight like that. And I said, oh, where's that picture? She goes, that's the tree in the backyard. <laughs> it was, right in the ground like that. We have to have trunk flare and root flare. This is where it's the most severe. Let's go back to genetics. A bottom tree, or a period environment, is used to water table coming up and going down. You ever go up by near New London in the spring when the Wolf River floods? You can walleye fish in the woods, okay? Those trees are used to the water coming up 
the wire goes down, sometimes they dump extra soil, they pull the water, pull the soil away, and those trees, those trees survive real good. They're bottling species. They are programmed by nature to handle disturbances to this part of the tree. Our upland species, chur maple, our oaks, our hickories, our walnuts, are not programmed to any disturbances around us, which is why they're tougher species to transplant than our bottomland species. So, if you have a silver maple and it looks like it's buried in the ground, it's going to have less of an impact than if you would have a sugar maple or a Norway maple which is an upland species. Once our root system is too deep in the ground, the tree has to start doing something to adapt. And they will do several things. Some species will put out a secondary root system. Right here. See my hands? I, I broke a light one time in the place. I always got to look up. Right here. here are my hands, and that's the root flare. That's my zone of rapid taper. You notice how these come off at right angles? These are secondary roots that formed because these are shutting down. These aren't fully functioning and trees going, I'm a little bit you know, loose here. I gotta do something. They adapted and grew right angle roots above. And if you can take a look right here, you see the color change? Right here is where the top of the ball was. This was still in the ball we planted. All right, so. How does this happen? <coughs> we put the nursery industry in a very difficult position because we buy a tree. Do you want to buy a crooked tree? No. We want to buy a tree that's straight, well rounded, well shaped. We grow them in rows, so two sides are going to be a little flat. It's supposed to live to be decades long, and we don't like a little crook or kink in it. We are really demanding on the nursery grower industry. So, this is how it goes. They grow whips. They call them a whip. They'll get eight feet of growth in one year. They grow up in uh, Washington and Oregon. They ship them to the nursery states. We ship them to uh, Wisconsin, Minnesota, Indiana, New York, Illinois, Michigan. Those are some very, very good, good growing conditions, fertile soil. They get these whips. If they plant it right here, what's likely to happen? It's going to fall over. And that $50 tree is going to be a $500 tree because someone's going to have to buy the stake, stake every tree. Johnson's Nursery down in Milwaukee in Jackson, Wisconsin plants 19,000 whips a year. That's stakes and ties and the whole bit. That would, be, that would be a lot of labor and a lot of income to do that. So they stick them in the ground a little bit deeper to stand up. All right, that makes sense to me because we have to demand buy a straight tree. As soon as you stick them a little bit deeper and your root system needs soil, oxygen, nutrients, what happens to the root system? It starts changing, doesn't it? starts to alter itself a little bit. This one I pulled out of the pot. Okay, here's my root flare. What do we got here? There it is. There's the secondary coming off. Coming in right there. It's a nice handle to hold on to it too. Okay. This one right here. I'm going to blast them. All right. The twine's one thing. How about this right handle? This handle here to show I can show you this. Here's my root flare. This is planted up here, a secondary root, trying to keep the tree alive. Trunk goes in the air, roots go in the ground. It's the whole key to proper planting. Now, here we got this caged beast. If we were going to dig a hole, it would be, because you'll see the basket sticking out of the ground. The hole is this big, right? Okay. What happens in the Fox Valley once you get past about the first 10 inches of soil? What do you hit? Yeah, the profanity zone. Yeah, yeah. It is miserable and you should say those words you're not supposed to say. Okay. How deep do I really need to dig this hole? I just got to put the roots in the ground, right? That's it? Yeah. Yeah. Because the roots are spreading out, dominant. They're not growing down. We don't dig deeper. We don't want. We plant at the root flare. Right, don't plant deeper. We just dig deeper. They just change that a little. I mean, it used to be twice as wide, twice as deep. We used to go twice as wide, twice as deep. Leave the bottom south. Still in the debate. 
but they're started saying that it makes more sense. Here's, yeah. here's the debate. I've been speaking on tree planting since 1992. It's taken a long time. Yeah. We've got the American nurseryman standards have changed, and we're understanding where the roots are growing. The roots have to grow out the best place. Now, in this hole, where's the best soil? It's where you dug the hole, right? Because it's aerated. The best soil is from the nursery compared to some of the junk we get to plant in. So the best soil is right in there. If I stick this deep and the roots are down low, are they going to just be easy to grow up? They're coming up. And once they come up, they're disorientated. So they know to come up and go out. They might. But where's the best soil in the area? It's right in their home. So they come up and they stay in the home. And when they are above the zone of rapid taper, they are a stem girdling root. Now, can you see the stem girdling roots here? This is above, and this is above. Here's my, here's my zone of rapid taper where my hands are. But, it's going to take some years for this to get bigger. Remember, it's bigger in diameter every year. This root gets bigger in diameter every year. So how many years is it going to take before these touch? Maybe 7 to 20, 7 to 25. And when they start to touch, these guys become this. And the tree starts to die. And then I get called out and someone goes, can you save my tree? And I can't. I can't. There's no pixie dust, and magic wands, or anything I can do. And the first thing people start to do, oh, the tree's not looking good. It's kind of got less leaves. It's dying from the top down. I need to fertilize it. And we start throwing fertilizer on. The fertilizer speeds up the process. Stem girdling roots. University of Minnesota's research came up with 82%, I believe it was, the trees in the Minneapolis St. Paul area. The street trees are all too deep in the ground. Because what we were taught was to plant the tree at the depth it was growing out of the nursery. Plant the depth of the pot, plant the depth of the ball. But we don't allow the nursery growers to plant at the root flare because the trees fall over because we make a, a crooked tree and nobody want to buy the crooked tree or pay $500 for a $50 tree. The difference, 20 minutes in the life of the tree, life of the depth of the tree is at planting time. Take the soil down, take it to your roots. You dig a smaller hole and it's less work. <laughs> I am for less work. Okay? Now, <coughs> genetically, here we are. This is where this thing is planted. Do you notice the branches here that were planted in the ground because this is the top? Okay? This is all the root system had. I removed this with a shovel. It was so loose. It was putting out about a quarter inch of growth a year. I could just push it back, push it over, dug the whole thing out. It came out like a dart, like a loose tooth. It's too deep in the ground. It should have been planted right here. Now it's all I had to do is dig a hole that deep. Set up to live its full life expectancy. This is my petrified spaghetti. <laughs> what happens with our shrubs, you ever see some shrubs have a tougher time in winter? Some of the evergreens always get winter damage. They don't fall over because they're going to be the site the height the trees do. These are the root systems that are not spread out to dominate the site they're on. We don't spread the roots out of, of the pot and we plant too deep. If So it stands up. And then we put the soilless mix over the top of it. We buy the tree in the pot and take home the plant at that top, right? What's the last thing we do then? We throw out a shovel of dirt on top, don't we? Get in a little deeper. When it's growing in the nursery, they cultivate between the rolls and the soil comes up sometimes. And we start getting it deeper. When we plant, knock the soil down to the root system. I'm going to show you some slides here in a minute and how you can do that. They make it less work, and you can set your tree up so it can thrive, not just survive. Now, some species don't develop stem girdling roots very fast because the stem rots off before. 
When this happens, this is the failure, the root system is left in the ground. If you have to have oxygen, <coughs> water, nutrients, you're too deep in the ground, you have less oxygen. Less oxygen, you're not doing the respiration thing. You are more subject to being attacked by fungi. And the fungi decomposes the tree and actually rots and fails and snaps. This is a deep planting problem. This isn't a tree failure, this is a planting problem. All right, this one's cool. This is really cool. Okay, here's the story. I'm doing a presentation down at a park in Madison. And I'm talking with a colleague, and he's got the group inside this park building. I went outside, and this Madison, City Madison forestry truck pulls out. And the guy pulls out, and he's got this thing covered in dirt, and the whole tree's on top yet. And he goes, damn, would you look at this? He goes, I noticed this thing has been dying. I checked the planting records. This was planted 22 years ago. All right, I should not be putting up a 22-year-old root system holding over my head. Okay, make sense? Okay. He goes, I took it out with a shovel. I didn't have to use the saw. It, the crown was really bad. I said, cut the top of the tree up. Let's pull this off. I want you to be able to take a look at this. But the trunk is 100% girdled by its own root system. I want you to look over here, and you can see where the root flare was. Right here. Up here is the soil line where it was planted. It was prepared for burial when it was planted. That's the difference. Set up for its full life expectancy. Now, someday before we retire, we'll take this and carve a face on it and sell it in Door County. Okay. <laughs> yeah, that'd be just, if I had that talent. But 12 years in the landscape and lived. They'll just crash one day. The root system is done. This is not a root system set to dominate the site. Set. The root flare is down here by my hands. Here's how it is caused by us. Okay. Here's the test. You know where I'm coming over here. Okay. Can you show me where the next root bud is where growth will begin? There are none. <laughs> what was that? There are none. There are none. Yes, she's correct. Okay. Roots don't have buds. If we look at the top of the tree, we'll see a bud. We'll see a winter bud where the growth begins in the spring. Roots don't have buds, so where do they start growing from? How does that happen? Well, this fine little root here. You know, we always try to keep moist and get the thing in the ground, protect the root hairs. How long does this live? Two weeks. Here's the zone of rapid taper. Always flushing. New little root hairs. All those leaves, when you don't like trees in October when you're raking, right? they're, not, they're not as cool in October, you gotta rake all that yard up. All those leaves that drop, that's about me, root hairs die off a year underground. The tree flushes. If it finds the good stuff, Water, nutrients, oxygen, it keeps going. If it doesn't, it stops, dies back, goes another direction. It doesn't grow searching, it has to have it. Okay? If this table was a pool of water, right, go ahead, act like water. Oh, you guys are good. Okay. <laughs> and I'm the tree. If the soil isn't moist here, I don't know that's there. And I don't go like a snake looking. The roots grow the way a bullet goes. Dr. Carl Whitcomb. Oklahoma State came up with that line. It's a great line because it's going straight as long as it has good stuff. If not, die back in the direction. Where's all the energy come from? The zone of graphic taper. The heart to pulse the brain. That's what's pushing out. What part of the tree gets compromised at planting time? That zone, isn't it? That zone. Okay. So, where is it? Here it is. Here's my red flare you see in this sample. I've cut it off. When we counted the rings on this thing, we went to the middle of the, middle of the trunk, middle of the branch. On a root, I had these marked in black. You won't find the little black dot in nature, okay, so don't look for it. That's the center of the, that's the root, that's the growing point of the root. 
Because nature knows it has to grow down. If it grows up, it would come in contact with the trunk. Nature has engineered a tree to not have stem girdling roots. We've met the enemy and it's us. We cause it.
I haven't told you anything different today or anything new. I've told you how trees grow. That's how I've talked about. We have known for a long time how trees grow. A lot of this was uncovered. My colleague of mine was working on his master's degree at Purdue University, and he's taking tree physiology from a gentleman who wrote the definition of trees for Encyclopedia Britannica. And he had an elective, so he took nursery tree management across, across the street in the other building. He's going, wait a minute. These two things conflict. And it's the same plant. Trees are an incredible fragmented industry. Somebody grows it. Somebody designs the planting. Somebody else does the planting. Somebody else takes care of the tree. And the person who's probably cheaper than all that, and whatever in-law or friend who owns the chainsaw, ends up cutting the tree down someday. It's the same plant. And a lot of different people working on it. A lot of different people working on it. All right. I want to go through some pictures and show you some of the things I just got done talking about. inch up against the trunk of the tree with mulch. You can taper it away and have it be a little thicker, two or three inches at that point. But over mulching, it's just like sticking it too deep in the ground. You seal moisture up against the trunk of the tree. Okay, we live in an urban forest for the benefits of trees. And that's the end. Thanks for coming. <laughs> right. That tree is in Milwaukee and uh, uh, Deconia, which used to be a cattle path going into Madison. And that burrow has been about 175 years. Look how tight that area is in there. It's adapting. They can adapt. It's the depth of the root system that makes a difference. Okay. Not really a good thing if you're the tree. This is an example of the root plate. There's no wrapping paper. has to come out. It doesn't have a choice. It has to do that, and it will move things out of the way when it has to. This is, that's interesting, okay? So when the tree dies, they put the sidewalk in. Okay, when I told you about where root systems go, does that little bump make a difference? <laughs> no, not one bit. That's a great tree one. I'd love to see that in our communities. That would really be a wonderful thing. Remember this, trunk flare or root flare. That is the secret to success in your trees. That's a cut off piece looking down at it. You can see the root plate right there sticking up. Can you guys see this or should I dim the lights a little bit? You okay? Mm -hmm. All right. The root plate will move things out of it. You can lose a kid underneath that thing right there. See the raised part? That's real common to see. It's like up on a throne. That's the root plate. That's the depth we should have been in. Now, here's one of the fascinating things. The nursery industry measures its trees six inches above where they sell it. So if you buy a two-inch tree, it's measured six inches above. This is where the top of the ball was on this one. You see the color change right here. So this tree is measured right here. If it was correct, we measured down here. You can just add some money onto your tree. It's good to know when you're selling them. So that's, that one was good or that one wasn't good? No, we're sitting, the roof there is down here. We're buried. Because you're kind of straight going to the ground. It's too high. Yeah. Well, no, the tree's too deep. The root flares up to the ground, so it should be high. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Right here? That's trunk. That's root coming out. Look at that. <laughs> Dominating the site and center. Yeah. Gotta spread out that down. This is interesting. Right. This is a tree in the guy's front yard. It was walking in the right way as a street tree. Um, he's going to do a little landscaping, so he took a chisel and stump grinder, he cut off the base like that, and ended up like that. That's the root system. It died within that year. Now that looks very nice, doesn't it? Okay. That's what he did to get down there. He cut off the root flare to, uh, to create that. So, okay, there's a stem really root right there. I'm going to see if I can't get that. How do I dim the lights? Where do I dim the lights? Okay. 
Have you ever seen this? Roots coming up? Now, follow it. Here are the roots, and then they dive down. Why do they dive down? They're diving down to the cut root ends. When the tree was cut, it was moved from the nursery. Those cut root ends should be near the top. When the roots come down, it's telling the trees to be in the ground. Look how it's going straight to the ground. In nine, early 19, in 1980, there were publications out from UW that said plant deep to avoid surface roots. Deep planting causes the surface roots. Okay, you see the tree growing along? That's the base of the tree. We used to cut, try to cut stagger early roots off until we found out, okay, where do you cut them off? They're stacked all the way down to the zone of rapid paper. This is a picture of a tree. They had the planting records for it. That's the tree going into the ground. The intern was able to push the tree and pull it. They've been over 20 years in the ground. They used the front of the loader after cutting the tree down. We pulled up the root system, and that's all we had. We had one root coming off this one. It's deep planting. One of the things that uncovered this was in 1992, a tree in the city of Milwaukee, the forestry department, was hit by a car, and it just popped right out of the ground. We go, How did that happen? That can't happen. <laughs> That happened because the root system was too deep. We started to learn about root systems. Sugar maple. That whole street's sugar maple. It's not fall. When a tree takes that early fall color, it's a tree calling for help. That's not fall. Okay? That's midsummer. Notice the tree on the left and the tree on the right look pretty good, right? Okay, that's the tree in the fall color. That's the trees on the other side. You see the difference? Sugar maple used to be told, don't plant sugar maple in an urban residential environment. It can't handle it. It doesn't like salt. It doesn't like clay. It doesn't like deep planting. Don't forget this. That looks a little different, doesn't it? It's a tree dying out. It's a root system wrapping around it. This one, you can see where the, the soil line is right here. Snapped out of the ground. Here. There's where the early root right was. And we didn't see where the indentation is. That's a Russian olive, so basically who cares, right? I, I don't like Russian olive very much. Okay. Now, if one planting strip isn't good enough, let's put a double one in there to really confine that root system. Now I can see how this one happened. Hey boss, we don't have enough blacktop to finish the job. Okay, put some tree wells in. That tree isn't going to be able to adapt and do very well. Plus, that's going to be pretty miserable if you're trying to plow snow. But that's a tomb surrounded by black pepper. This one is a favorite. This is a classic. Okay? That's black top. That's black top put around the tree. No more weeding! Woohoo! <laughs> okay, you know what the hardiness zone is? Hardiness zone is the zones that they give on the temperature extremes that plant can live. Okay, uh, Florida is like a zone 12, we're about a zone 4 or 5 here, and it goes smaller the farther north you get. Well, I guess we found out that the hardiness zone must have changed right down the middle of the street. There's nothing leaked out here, and everything leaked out on the other side of the street. So we figured that's right where the hardiness zone must change from 4 to 5 right in that street, right? Okay, I'm kidding. All right, don't write that down. Every one of those trees going down the street, what is wrong with that? Well, do an investigation, take a look. That's what we have for root systems. Right here is the soil line. This is how we grow. We have to grow in rows. Right there, where the uh, finger is, is called the bud graft union. And what we do, we be able to develop superior quality trees. And what these superior trees do is we take the native wild root stock and then we grab things on. Like a honey locust tree has great big thorns and great big seeds. We've been able to breed those out, so we graft on the seedless variety of honey locusts. We have 210, I think, and there's different kinds of crab apples we can use. Get a little crazy in the crab apples. We can graft them on there. It's called the bud graft union. It's grafting trunk to trunk. That went around three times at one row. There's the root system. There's the soil line. We were measuring the depth and where it was. This is how we used to do it. We'd take the shovel, we'd measure the depth of the 
tree. We left the twine on. We threw it in. Then we started, okay, now let's just pull the top of the burlap back. And we started doing that as an industry. We have the basket out over here. All right, left it all in, threw it all in there. All foreign things going into the hole. Now follow me. This is 1992 Wisconsin Arbor Association Summer Conference where the tree care industry was exposed and things began to change. It was a very slow process, a very slow change. Where we've come a long way in the green industry recognizing where the roots grow and how to plant trees better. That tree is ready for planting. Make a dish shape hole. Allowing the wrist to come up. Pull off the burlap. See the soil line? That part of the tree is this. That's trunk, right? You don't see anything coming off it? The root system has not been tampered with. The roots are still covering the soil, they're not been tampered. All that is, the wall is still in there, the soil from the top above the roots was knocked off. That's all that happened. Okay. It was backfilled, mulch, that's where the soil line is, the original. That's trunk, isn't it? Trunk in the air, roots in the ground. That's it. Can you go back for So is that little piece to the lower lot, to the little bit of the root actually starting to show it? Right here? Yes. What that is, is a high secondary root. Okay. And because it came up and went down, they just left it there and they had the mulch coming up to it. So it's okay that that's good like that? Yes. The secondary root. Secondary root. Now here's your call. If you're looking at a secondary root, it's generally like a pencil size or smaller. You can pretty much snip them off. Okay. If it's bigger, the tree's adapted already, so we, so we go with that. On this one here, these secondary roots, I would plant right here because they're pretty well established for it. So you would just plant those almost right level with the ground, maybe even like you're mulch right. cover it, or would you let the Rarely do the roots come off exactly even. You right. get one little higher, one little right. lower. So I get one in the soil, the other one might be half soil, okay. half mulch. Okay. <coughs> one soil line. Okay. Okay. One soil line. There's a saying, plant, plant too high, it won't die. Plant too low, it won't grow. <coughs> okay. We used to say, just plant high, just stick it up higher. But if we left the soil up against the trunk, then we are defeating that purpose by setting it up higher. Yes, sir. So, so that wood wall, Yep. If you take it off the burlap and pull the wire, take yep. the metal off, and you did not upset the soil around the tree. That's right. Um, why not? You don't, you don't, how do you mean? I'm talking about the, the soil that was in the roots. You leave the roots covered in the soil, you just expose the trunk, you just expose down to the roots. So you didn't bring any of the roots out? Nope, because it was a, a ball burlap tree. If you're in a container, you might have to bring the roots out because in the container they could have been growing in the container. Well, I've seen some in, uh, in, in Berlin that they do yep. just like they were in the container. Now, once we get below the root flare, we don't care if it's growing in a circle or what they do because they can graft to each other. It's when they come in contact with the trunk that they do damage. Now, if you're a root and you're below the trunk, you're below the root flare, you can still grow in a circle. You will go out because you have to dominate the sites you're on. If you're growing in a circle and you're up against the trunk, some days that gets bigger and the choking process begins, the girdling process. So we don't care once we get below, below the root flare. We'll do another one. When it's in the ball, you can feel the cut run ends and how deep you have to go. They dug the hole, they measured it. You get, and this, this is, where's that one? Over here. This thing, full of soil and everything, is going to weigh about 300 pounds. You dig the hole, you get this in the hole, and you don't have it in the center of the hole, you start the tree dance. Okay, and this is the tree dance, as you're trying to move this thing. Everyone in the literature says, when you plant a tree, don't grab it by the trunk. Well, what do you touch it with? We don't grow handles on it. We all grab it by the trunk. And we try to get into the hole. If you look here, it's a small hole. You get the tree in, and when you're all done, you take the shovel on the outside and you just flip the soil. You make your hole bigger. Because you aerate the soil and you flip it, and the roots can come out. That way we make the wider hole. 
instead of digging the big white hole, which is more work than throwing the soil back in. So dig a small hole, get the tree upright, pull the stuff off. If it's in a basket, before you put it in the hole, you cut the bottom of the basket off, so when you put it in the hole, you just cut the side and you peel it right up. Do you follow that? Okay. So you do not want to disturb the soil at all. Around the roots. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So even though you're peeling everything off, you have to be careful to put that away so it will still stay intact and you can just pull that yeah. away. Now where it can be a problem is if it's been raining for three weeks or something and the root ball is really soggy, okay, really wet, okay, and sometimes I've had to leave the bottom of the basket on or maybe the bottom of the burlap, but my roots coming out are the most important one because I don't want that whole thing to collapse. People will say, well, you have to keep that intact. You put soil around it, you will keep it intact. It's upright, they pulled that off. That's the root flare, you can see what the top of the ball was. All they did was expose the trunk. Difference between dirt and soil. Soil is something you want. Dirt's under your nails, okay? Dirt's against the trunk, soil's against the roots. That's the two differences between my roots, my roots and the trunk of the tree. They back it, and you can see where the flare is on the left, and then you stake it. If the tree has been too deep in the ball, and probably about 10, 12 years ago, most trees were probably six to 10 inches too deep in the ball, there's a lot of nursery growers who are planting their stock all higher, and you can often find your root flare very close, very, very close to the top of the ball. So what's that mean? That means you've got a lot more root system coming with your tree, don't you? And your ability to survive and thrive has just increased. Yes? Can I straighten out those roots that are in the uh, the container? Once you're below the root flare, it doesn't matter. Now, if I was planting this and these roots could move, I might be able to not have to cut these off. I might be able to bend these out. But one of the things about knocking the soil down, you will see any stem early roots. And if they're already established, I'm going to prune this right off. But I'm not exposing my, root, my roots, my root flare. I'm keeping the soil on that. So when I'm told you destroyed the root ball, no, I, just, I opened up the trunk. I'm keeping the root ball intact. That's the final thing. Now you turn, uh, getting back to the question that we have here. Uh, you've only gone as deep as you need to go with yep. the of the bottom of it. Right. But then after you put your tree in the hole and you took your back and back throw. Yep. And then you went around and you broke up the ground. I dug a shovel and flipped it. Dug a shovel and all flipped it. Around. All the way around. And if my hole's not perfect, I just adjust it to make it a nice So it made you, it, you upset the top six inches of soil further out to give oxygen in the ground. Yep. You're inviting them up. I usually look at it as one shovel blade deep. It's usually eight inches. One shovel blade, flip it. We take these great big holes, you try to roll the thing in the center of the hole, and we have to fill it back up. Bring, bring the hole to the tree. Yeah. It certainly does. Alright, there's a stem early root. We're going to cut off and plant it. Tree in the ball. Finding the flare. That's too hot. All right, that's, that's a bad point. Leaving everything on and sitting on the ground. This is how it happens. We start out with zero tree spade. We pluck the tree at the nursery. Bare root is a great way to plant. You can know exactly how deep your hole has to go. You can see your entire root system. If you have anything above, you can usually push it right out. One person can carry the tree. Container can be fine. You do need to spread your roots out. If they're coiled but below the root flare, you're okay. That's not soil that comes in our pots. If it was soil, it would be able to carry it. It's a soilless mix. It will not wet the same way as the soil that's around the hole. So you have to be cautious of that. We used to slice up. If you just do that, what do you have? Shorter curling roots. That's all you have. You need to pull them and spread them out. Did I mention root flare? Trunk here? Did they bring that up here? Okay. That'd be too high. Okay. <laughs> Now, we talk about the right tree in the right place. We can do the planting correct all the way. We can do everything correct. We still need 
to fall in the category of what I say is common sense. Just because the spec said the tree is supposed to go there, it doesn't mean it's going to go there. Okay? Thanks.